So I will be against. I think it sounds better in French, because con in English doesn't doesn't really sound very good. Anyway, it's probably easier in French to say it. So these are my conflicts of interest. You can see it on the slide. So my first slide is very close to uh, Matteo's first slide. Indeed, there are probably four conceptual reasons uh, in favor of uh, bi-therapy, of uh, combination therapy when treating uh, severe infections in ICUs. Now, the first reason is obvious. If uh, the uh, infection is a polymicrobial infection with uh, MDR or an enterobacteria uh, or uh, bacilli, well, it's very clear that in this specific type of situation, combination therapy is good. That's clear for everybody. Second reason, and Matteo really insisted on it, and I associate myself with him, we are confronted with such a number of situations where infections can be induced by uh, uh, resistant uh, bacilli, BNG, and most of the time we just have to use combination therapy. And I'll come back to that later on because I think that maybe we uh, we do a bit too much. Third. Uh, reason in favor of combination therapy. We usually think that if we use uh, two antibiotics, then it's uh, possible to increase uh, uh, my, uh, the efficiency. And uh, there's a fourth reason. It's actually a dream we all have. Using two uh, antibiotics, we could perhaps uh, uh, prevent uh, the development of uh, resistant strains. I think I think that's a dream, because the infections that we know are not uh, tuberculosis. Now, concerning the first reason I mentioned, it's true that very often we have to. Uh, think that we're talking about the specific type of infection. But today, in our country and in many European countries, there is a, a major change in the, this type of infection. You can see here on the slide the different epidemiological data, but it's probably exactly the same thing in many other hospitals as well as in many other European regions. So it's that very uh, uh, strong pressure in favor of the use of uh, anti uh, there's actually very low pressure and so I think it's necessary to uh, use an empirical uh, treatment a glycopeptide for example in only a very limited number of cases and here on the slide you have the four uh, four situations that uh, could justify the use of uh, this kind of a therapy. This is the algorithm that we uh, use uh, in my hospital. And this uh, corresponds to relatively rare situations. And it's probably the same in all our uh, units. It's true that most of the time, because we're talking here about uh, uh, GNBs, very resistant GNBs. We have uh, to uh, uh, use combination uh, therapy just to have a broader spectrum. And indeed, we have a robust data. I uh, showing here uh, uh, work by Martinez published recently. But all this, all these studies can be read differently. 
different ways. For example, if you have a, a, a strain, a pseudomonas aeruginosa strain, and you have a vector lactamin broad spectrum, it's true that in most of our ICU, this monotherapy will be efficient for about two-thirds of the cases. And if we associate beta lectamine with an amino glycosin, then the percentage of cases will increase, cases will, will really act on the strain itself. True for other uh, pathogens here in red on the slide. But so you have these red microorganisms. But next to them, you can see there are quite a large number of bacteria for which uh, if you use uh, uh, combination therapy, it's not much better than monotherapy. So what is important is to uh, understand what this specific situation is. It's sometimes difficult. But in some cases, it's very clear there is nothing justifying that some of the infection was induced by one of the strains here in red. On the contrary, we have extremely robust data showing that there is absolutely no clinical benefit in favor of a combination therapy compared to a monotherapy. Here you have two uh, studies. These are a controlled randomized trial, uh, double blind. The first uh, uh, study was uh, conducted by uh, Darren Hayland. This is the second part of his uh, study. 740 patients were involved. Uh, they uh, developed a VAP. The uh, patients known to be colonized or infected with uh, Pseudomonas or uh, MRSA were excluded, as well as those who were immunocompromised. And Matteo showed uh, you the results of a sub-study of this one. And I, let me remind you that out of the 750 patients, only 56 patients were uh, uh, infected by a strain of uh, aerogenosa. So it was necessary to separate those patients who needed combination therapy from the rest of the patients, 56 patients out of 740 patients. So as you can see, uh, monotherapy plays a major role. And there was absolutely no difference. This is, was a randomized control study, so there was absolutely no uh, difference. Second randomized controlled uh, trial was uh, uh, carried out by our German uh, colleagues and uh, uh, published last year in uh, JAMA. We're talking here about septic uh, patients or uh, septic shock uh, admitted in ICU. And as you can see, their SOFA score is uh, uh, quite okay, you can see that it's uh, above nine. So these are severe uh, uh, patients. And you can see what the result is for meropenem alone or uh, the combination. No, no beneficial effect over time and no benefits in terms of uh, uh, survival in this study. And this study is probably the uh, most robust one conducted so far from a methodological point of view. So what I think is the following. In many situations, I think that monotherapy could still be used even for empirical treatment as long as you're able to set aside the patient's uh, uh, you think were uh, infected differently and so would not benefit from a monotherapy. You can see here what the uh, guidelines are for uh, nosocomial pneumonia and for early uh, infections in uh, ICU when if there's no 
you can see that monotherapy has a role to play here, and it's indisputable. Now, I'd like to uh, come back to some kind of uh, saga. This, uh, we, we did contribute, and we're talking here about a community-acquired pneumonia. Patients were uh, isolated, specific patients were isolated, and I think that the uh, the association with second generation cephalosporin and other is beneficial. It's it's a combination of therapy, but the uh, efficiency of the uh, macrolide is probably nothing to do with its uh, uh, anti-infectious agents. Probably linked to, to its uh, activity in terms of immunomodulating modulation. Now, concerning the healthcare associated pneumonia. We have risk factors uh, clearly identified, and uh, this enables us to uh, suspect that the infection is due not only by an enterobacteria, but uh, could be due to a uh, bacteria which is difficult to, uh, to eliminate. What is really important is that the, that, that was a major study uh, uh, published uh, a few months ago, 746 uh, uh, caps. And as you can see, even when there are two uh, risk factors, uh, then the share of uh, patients uh, requiring uh, broad-spectrum antibio uh, antibiotics is a bit less than 22%. And this is why I suggest the following strategy. I think it's possible to develop a decision-making algorithm in order to uh, decide uh, what would be the appropriate antibiotic therapy. When we combine antibiotics, uh, is the treatment more efficient? Well, we have animal models, and not for everything, but for some, and it's easy to show that the combination of some antibiotics enables us to have a real efficiency. That's the, quite an old uh, piece of paper. We're talking here about uh, uh, animals infected by uh, pyrogenosa. You can see that the rats uh, uh, were neurotropenic following a specific uh, treatment. Matteo uh, showed you this uh, meta-analysis, meta-regression uh, conducted by uh, our Canadian colleague Kumar, uh, which uh, shows important factors on the left side of the slide. You can see a meta-regression of the whole observational studies, which compared monotherapy with combination therapy. And indeed, when the initial death probability is above 25%, you see that all the points are right under the identity line, so they're in favor of combination therapy. But what is really interesting is when uh, the uh, uh, mortality probability is less, on the con well, the situation is completely different. All the points are above the line, which means that in uh, severe Patients, uh, patients with a septic shock, shock is probably necessary to use combination therapy. But and I, here I really uh, associate myself with Matteo. We're talking here about initial treatment of the infection. And we now have a very uh, robust reasons showing that, uh, that there's nothing in favor of uh, the uh, prolonged use of the combination uh, therapy. This is a piece of work by Carmen Pena. It's a, a prospective a study conducted in Spain. The authors uh, assessed uh, the potential benefits of uh, treatment combining two antibiotics. And indeed, if initially the patients received no active antibiotic on the, the strain, then the mortality is much higher. But if, be it a monotherapy or a combination therapy, you can see that mortality is exactly the same. 
And uh, if we take the uh, definitive, find the definitive treatment on day three, and we compare it with the patients who received a monotherapy after day three, and compare it with the patients who received a combination therapy for the whole treatment, and you can see that there are actually no benefits. So can we uh, uh, prevent the uh, development of resistant uh, strains? Well, nothing, nothing shows that so far. And let me remind you that when uh, uh, resistance emerges, it usually happens uh, in the uh, digestive tract. Now let me come back to Matteo's uh, conclusion. Combining two antibiotics initially is probably justified in patients with risk factors for uh, uh, difficult bacteria, MDR uh, bacteria, those who are neutropenic uh, and or patients with a septic shock. But it is then necessary to couple this strategy with de-escalation uh, as soon as day three or day five. Thank you very much.